this isn't really about the topic of today's roundtable, but it's on the board and it's something we want to show you. There, there's a URL there. Uh, is this large enough to re actually? I'm going to make this bigger here. Uh, so I just went to Google. I typed in 2015 hands-on research, and the first link is that thing right there. So I click on that link, and if I go to program, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, much better. If I click on program, if you look at the program, the first talk was Professor Sweeney, and there's a link that says video. And if I click on that link, well, what happens is going to depend exactly on your browser, but it looks like we have a couple different uh, video files. I haven't tried this yet. And I guess eventually this will be the case for the 2016 school as well, if you go to the program. Well, the faculty of this school are involved oh. in hands-on science, okay. small scale. That's Harry from last year. <laughs> so all, all the videos from last year are up. All the videos from this school will eventually be up under the program for the 2016 site. Does that include the snapshots? Um... <laughs> let us know at some point, but they have to be uh, processed, um, and so at some point they'll show up, but they will be, the snapshots will show up uh, on that website. Right, so these are just, reported. right now just the lectures, but that includes, for instance, Mike's Science Education, and the, uh, uh, I guess it didn't include the open microphone, it included Pietro's presentation last year on career development, for example. I have one other thing to show, unless somebody wants to make some opening remarks. Bring up the oh, okay. So this page has, this is not an ICT page, P page, I don't think. It, it has links to, um, it has links to this year's ICTP page for 2016. It also has, it has some different uh, content. Here's the 2015 group photo, which was out on the, the dock downstairs. Uh, and you can click on any of the past schools. Oh, and so here are some photographs from the hands-on sessions in 2015. But the, the, the second white website is mostly general information about past schools as well as current and photographs, I think is the main thing here. Yeah, but the histor historically in the beginning what we did was we put the session files and things like that on this website. So older, For some of the older schools, yes. The older schools, India and uh, uh, Cameroon and other schools, we put, we didn't have IC website and we didn't have Google Drive because that didn't exist um, and so the file, there are links to other files that from other right. sessions that might be interesting to you. You might want to look through that and there might be some content right. from other hands-on sessions so, that you didn't see here. Yeah, so this is the 2009 school and at the bottom we have links to the PDF files for the lectures at the 2009 school on this second website. This was before we were coming to ICTP.
All right, so maybe we should turn to today's topic is international collaboration. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, and funding, yes. And uh, I, I have something relatively specific to talk about, uh, but just a, a, as far as a general comment, uh, you know, we, we are here to help you and, and are happy to continue to discuss by email uh, possible funding opportunities, possible people to approach other than ourselves uh, for research opportunities and, and so forth. Uh, but in order to be successful in developing a uh, international collaboration, you know, a lot of the effort is going to be have to be made by yourselves in terms of finding available opportunities. And especially if you can find a source of funding and then approach a prospective mentor and say, hey, there's this really great program, and if you are willing to work with me, we can write a proposal and, and, and get the... This is, this is maybe more likely to be to attract a potential mentor than if you just write to somebody and saying, I am looking for a postdoctoral position or I'm looking for a graduate research fellowship. So you're, not at, you're, you're asking the person to work with you, uh, but if you're also asking them if they have money to pay for you, then the answer is more likely to be no. So I, I, I'm going to show you one example here of a possible source for many of you to, uh, to get a funding grant to study uh, internationally. And uh, I mean, let me start with the story and then I'm going to show you the, the, the specifics. Two years ago uh, at this school, one of the participants approached me and he, he said, there is this program that will allow, uh, let me back up. He, he was at the stage where he had a master's degree and he was looking to enroll in a PhD program in somewhere other than his own home country. And I've talked to many of you who are also, you know, have, have asked me for advice about where to apply for graduate school in the U.S., for example. So I know many of you are at that level, you're, you have a master's or will soon get a master's and are looking for a Ph.D. Many of you are looking for a postdoctoral position. So in this case, he, was, he, he, he told me, I, I have found this wonderful program that will fund uh, research, uh, that will fund young scientists from my own country to study for a PhD in Germany. So it required the student to be from one of a certain set of countries. It required the uh, advisor to be from Germany. And what I was able to help with was I knew somebody in Germany who had a similar scientific interest to the participants. I was able to put the two of them in touch and they were successful in, in, in getting funding. And this, so this program uh, is sponsored by a, a German research organization called DAAD. And so I'm not promoting study in Germany in particular, it's just this is an example I know and you can probably find other examples like this. But some of the other people I've spoken to this school have said, oh yes, DAAD, that's very popular in our, our country too. So. Uh, I did a Google search for just these, these four letters, D-A-A-D. Uh, there are two websites you might come to. Uh, there is D-A-A-D.de. That's the website in Germany. There's also D-A-A-D.org. And you want to avoid the DA.org because that's their North American website. This is opportunities for North American uh, researchers. So in my case, the first thing that came up on Google is DAA.de, but on other computers, I've gotten the other one. So we want DAA.de, uh, and this is a general website, and, and you see now there's information for foreigners and so forth, and... Uh, I'm sure you can navigate around and find, oh, there's, there's a link for finding scholarships. Actually, I found this link by, I always search for things in Google rather than use internal search engines. So I just typed in scholarship in da.de. I found this same page. And so here's a uh, page. Uh, there is a link to a scholarship database. 
Let me show you a little bit of the scholarship database. 214 scholarship opportunities. First one is only for students from Costa Rica. Do we have any participants from Costa Rica? Too bad. But there's 214 of those. The point I want to make with this is that there are some very specific ones, and the more specific the opportunity, if you are eligible, the more specific the opportunity, the more likely you are to be able to get this scholarship. So a, a, a good master's student from Costa Rica, if they are aware of this program, might have a very good chance of getting uh, funding. The second one is for refugees from Syria. The, 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 I haven't looked through all of them, but you can look through all of them and see if there is a scholarship opportunity appropriate for you. There is also, I'm going to back up, um, help in your country. If I click on that link, this German organization which funds international collaborations has offices in many different countries, Afghanistan, Argentina, and so you can find the link maybe to your local office, and then there is contact information, email, website. So through that, you can find information more specific to uh, your country. Most of these things are for scholarships for study in a PhD program, let's say. But there is information on post for uh, postdoctoral positions as well. So I Googled postdoc and this German website, daad.de. And the first link I got here, here is info for postdocs and junior researchers. Again, this is, this is mainly about research in Germany. Uh, this suggests I go to this other website, research in Germany, junior researchers. There is some career development advice here, career options. Here's one, funding and fellowships for postdocs. And again, we have uh, several opportunities here to apply for a postdoctoral fellowship in order to have a postdoctoral position in Germany. So I'm just mentioning this is, you know, it, 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 this is a large enough organization that I think DAAD specifically is something that all of you might benefit from looking at. But I think there are many other opportunities like this as well. So in some cases, finding a uh, home in a PhD program, in a PhD research group, or finding a postdoctoral position is not just a matter of finding the right mentor or the right institution and applying directly, but it can be aided by finding some third party who is interested in funding such international collaborations. Um, <clears throat> I want to say something uh, about the UK, which is the country I know the most about. Uh, so. All the postdoc jobs and, and the faculty jobs and also some of the PhD studentships are all advertised centrally in one website, which is called jobs.ac.uk. Yeah, thank you. And um, they're organized by the scientific discipline, so jobs.ac.uk. So we're required by law to put everything up there, so everything is up there. Um, and... Um, you can uh, search by university or by scientific field, by deadline. So it's pretty, there's, there's a lot of UK uh, opportunities there. There's also, for those of you more in the soft matter uh, area, there's a, there's a mailing list which is used a lot throughout the world. If you Google soft matter uh, and, and leads uh, mailing list, uh, you will get to a website where you can sign up to this mailing list. And um, again, that carries um, job opportunities, not just in the UK, but um, uh, by many academics around the world. And sometimes a job opportunities bounced onto the mailing list uh, by somebody else. That sometimes covers also towards bio jobs, but kind of centered on soft matter. And perhaps another comment I want to make is um, there are postdoc jobs, which is basically when somebody already has found the money and has, has a well-defined task, more or less well-defined task for, for somebody to, to, to carry out. And then there's, uh, there's fellowships where uh, 
like um, like Brian was saying, where perhaps you, together with uh, the host, actually have to write together a project which is centered uh, on you with your CV, and um, and the two are slightly different. Usually, usually the second, often it's for somebody a bit more senior because it's a it's more uh, gives you more independence. You are defining the project yourselves, sometimes in collaboration with the the host, sometimes entirely by yourselves. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, what I'm wondering about is I'm in a slightly different situation than everybody else here in the sense that I'm in a private liberal arts undergraduate only institution in the United States. So my situation is different um, and I was in particular thinking about that yesterday when Mike was talking about these different teaching techniques. My tenure is based not on getting grants and publishing papers, but on doing a good job teaching. And so it's a different focus. So I am under no pressure to write grants. I'm going to write proposals, and I'm going to continue publishing papers. I intend to do those things, but my constraints are different. So one thing I was thinking about commenting on is that the process of getting the kind of job that I got um, the, is different, and I'm not sure how aware you guys might be of this type of institution. If you're looking for a faculty position, at least in the U.S., um, they are looking for diversity in their programs, especially in physics. This is a real problem, both in terms of gender, but also racial and ethnic uh, uh, back background. We tend to be white males uh, on my entire you know, all my colleagues are white males. And so uh, they are looking for, you know, they are looking for diversity, but um, that job is a very different job. And when you apply to it, and I, and I made this comment, and I talked to students in the U.S. that were graduate students looking to apply to get a job, and very often people put together a nice package of research that they've done and all these things and their research plan, and that is a... a entirely appropriate for a research institution job and is completely inappropriate for what the kind of job that I was looking to get. It's a very different job. If you don't understand the job, they know it immediately and very often people with very good applications for research positions also throw one or two applications to these small schools and think that, well, I'll definitely get offers from them because I'm so good. But the people at these schools look at them and they see the application and they say, this person does not want this job, <laughs> right? So make sure that whatever you're doing, whether it's a fellowship or whatever, you're doing all of the things that we talked about. You make sure that your application is focused. It's not one application that you throw to all scholarships and it's not one application for a faculty position, but that you research the institution. I made sure I researched who was there and what research they were doing and did all the these things to make sure my application was tailored to the particular institution. You guys probably understand that or you wouldn't be here right now. So uh, uh, keep that in the, the back of your mind. And if you want more information about the kind of job that I have and what my life is like and what, what I do, uh, uh, feel free to talk to me about that. Right, so uh, building up on the diversity comment of Bruce, so I, I just wanted to share with you that uh, it's a known problem throughout the world that there is an unequal participation of males and females in science. So there are certain fellowships that are meant specifically for females to pursue postdoctoral positions or like, uh, you know, have exchange internationally. Uh, and so uh, many of you might want to utilize that to your benefit. So one of the fellowships that I'm aware of uh, is a L'Oreal Women in Science Fellowship. And if you just Google uh, it, you will uh, find a link to that. Um, and then during, um, so, as a young uh, graduate student, um, there are other opportunities uh, that uh, I came across while looking for postdoc positions. So I can. So there's a, um, you know, there's a European um, Marie Curie Fellowship, which is meant to foster international collaborations uh, with Europe in, um, throughout. Um, and then there are certain fellowships which are um, specifically targeted for people who want to do interdisciplinary research. And so like complex um, 
so so this school which is uh, focused on complex systems and nonlinear dynamics has uh, many connections to uh, biology and so if at any point of uh, your career you f feel like making a switch then you should definitely look at human frontier science program uh, which uh, encourages uh, physicists and chemists and mathematicians to engage in biomedical research along with an international collaborator. So, uh, so these are the few fellowships I wanted to talk about. And then, in particular, um, my own, own home country, India, encourages uh, a lot of international collaborations. And its main funding agency, Department of Science and Technology, comes out periodically with special programs like. In Indo-Russian, um, uh, you know, funding or Indo-Egypt funding, and you know, these are the few that I'm aware of. Um, and and these funding mechanisms don't necessarily give a lot of equipment or consumable money, but it gives a lot of freedom to travel. So it gives you a lot of travel money, and so you can come and visit. Um, any Indian uh, science lab or vice versa. So, um, so that's all I have to say about my limited knowledge on international collaborations. Yeah. Uh, Mahesh. Uh, good morning, everyone. My situation is a bit uh, special and different in the sense that I am based at an international university situated in Japan, and all our funding comes straight from the Prime Minister's Office of Japan because we are a very new university. Having said so, I want to emphasize the importance uh, of writing grants and proposals because they help us sharpen our ideas, and they are a litmus test of how good or how uh, 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 well thought our uh, problems are through uh, a peer review process, right? Uh, in the specific context of Japan, uh, Brian, I'll need your help to pull the pages up. I want you to point. Uh, uh, to, uh, I want to point you uh, to a few resources. There are both government and uh, private uh, funding uh, options. Uh, JSPS, the Japan Society for Promotion of Science, is the Japanese equivalent of the National Science Foundation in the United States or the European Research Council in Europe. They strongly encourage a lot of international participation. They specifically have fellowships for students and postdoctoral researchers coming from outside Japan. And these are uh, pretty popular within Asia, say Philippines or China or Korea, but uh, they are not as well advertised beyond the, uh, the Asian uh, boundaries. Uh, the, if you go through this, you'll find the, the, a link at the top on international collaborations. And you will find links and uh, funding deadlines for at every stage, students, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, travel grants, or uh, research collaborations. Uh, other private Japanese foundations that are active internationally, Canon Foundation, Mitsubishi Foundation, Nikon Foundation, all the electronics companies of Japan that you have heard of, they have their own foundations that they, that through which they provide philanthropic support for education worldwide. Uh, I want to touch upon a point that uh, Prerna made about the Human Frontier Science Program. I am one of the grant awardees of the Human Frontier Science Program for the Foot Biomechanics Project. And uh, it is an extremely competitive program. Only 4% of the applications get funded. But it is also a program that comes with very few strings attached. In what sense? The question must come from the life sciences, but broadly defined. The collaboration must come from different countries involving people who have never worked together before. And it must be interdisciplinary. That is, if one of the uh, PIs, the princip uh, principal investigators of the project, is uh, a biologist, the other two have to be non-biologists. It so happened that in our collaboration, none of us were, were, is a biologist. One is a mechanician, the other is an applied mathematician, and I'm an experimental physicist. The, and we go to the annual grant awardees meeting every year. It, the recent one was three weeks ago in Singapore, and we are constantly stressed to put the word out because 
they want to attract as many applications as possible from anywhere in the world. You don't have to be from one of the countries that are member countries of the Human Frontier Science Program to qualify for their funding pool. You can come from any nation. The PI, the principal investigator, must come from, the, from one of the 21 countries, but the co-PIs can come from anyone. I'll give you specific examples. The Cairo Museum in Egypt got funded for that, and it was a very beautiful work involving mummies. Uh, there was another work from, funded in uh, Kenya for uh, involving a very interesting combination of architecture and termite mounds. So these are specific examples. The last point, which is little to do with funding, but more to do with the social aspects of collaborations. When you go seek collaborations, we ideally want collaborations to be a uh, partnership amongst equals, right? And what I would like to keep you in mind, and this actually was triggered by a comment that Pietro made yesterday about metacognition. I had never heard of this term, but it is something I have applied uh, when I have sat back and thought about it, which is I have observed myself. What are my strengths? What works, wh what works best for me? Because each of us has our own individual style of doing science. And in doing so, we would like to seek out those with whom we share a common interest in problems. But beyond that, we also seek out those who are... Uh, who share a common style, where we complement each other's style. I'll give you two specific examples. I have a very close friend who sits, lives in the middle of the Negev desert all by himself. We have a collaboration that where we just start in the morning, go on a hike, we discuss problem as we go on a hike, we reach some ruins, we sit there and do the problem. And when we do the problem, we don't even utter out complete sentences. We just say words and we understand each other. That is the level of comfort we have. Two other friends on this HFSP project, one sits at Brown, the other at Yale. When we get together, our teams get together, there are no inhibitions, there is no insecurity. If we think an idea is wrong, we just say, no, just shut up and sit down, your idea is wrong. And our students and postdocs are, they're very surprised, pleasantly so, because they point it out to us that we find your style of working very, very natural. You want to seek out collaborations that will work forever, for the long term. And in doing so, you will end up self-selecting people to work with who will uh, share that style with you. So keep that in mind when you go looking for opportunities. Thank you. Let me just mention uh, just a somewhat technical point to follow on to one of the things Mahesh mentioned. He mentioned this Human Frontier Science Program, and this is a particularly nice website. Some of these programs have better websites than others. I, I formed this opinion just based on their homepage. But the particular thing I wanted to point out here is while there are many links to funding, and, and you can see here Mahesh talked about, you can look at what are eligible countries and, and so forth. Just as important these things if you can find information on awardees. Here's awardees. Here's the list of awards made in March, made in 2016. And you can look and see what have been successful proposals for this particular program. So before applying to any of these programs, if you can find on their website examples of successful applications, that can be very much a help in preparing your own application. Yeah, and the one thing that occurred to me, I wasn't really prepared to do this this morning, um, no one told me, <laughs> uh, was the one way that uh, private liberal arts schools do actually collaborate is through study abroad programs. And, and in particular, my institution loves to have study abroad programs where the students spend a semester uh, taking classes, potentially doing research and things like this uh, in another country. And so that's a big part of what they do. And also... Um, our school has, um, if you know, potential undergraduates, uh, 
has scholarships for international students and things like this and just other ways in which in my context we have uh, uh, more of an international collaboration but that is, like I said my my situation is a little bit different but also if you think oh wow my my home institution would love to have a study abroad program with Center College in Kentucky let me know and I'll see what I can figure out because they are looking for different opportunities uh, um, that would allow students uh, the uh, exchange of students between the institutions, and there's funding for that for the, through the institution, through foundations and stuff like that. You're next. <laughs> uh, let me skip me for a minute. I was in, had to prepare my thoughts. Sorry. Uh, I have done my own. Yeah. Um, so let me just say a little bit about since some of you are in the situation of uh, thinking about you know in master's programs you're, you're in and you want to pursue a PhD program. I've had a couple of people approach me about asking me what 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 does one need to do to do to study in the United States to apply for a PhD program um, turns out I don't know if you're aware of this but we have a very large international population so in my school uh, 50 percent actually even more half of this more than half of the students are from uh, international programs uh, I just mentioned we had a student who was just accepted uh, it's coming this fall from Shahid Beheshti University he was a Turkish student but it was an undergraduate um, so this is uh, very common. Um, what do you need to do? Well, there are things you sort of the, the important parts are there are the set of it's a, really the starting point is to uh, if you have particular programs you're interested in, um, go to university websites, the departmental websites, uh, look at the research programs. Uh, if certain programs appeal to you, uh, look at the application process and that would typically involve, you're taking something like a standardized uh, exam, a general exam, a graduate uh, admissions, a GRE, uh, as well as a subject exam, uh, for, certainly in physics that's typically required. TOEFL, there is the test of English as a foreign language, that's very important. Um, and the sort of cycle for that is uh, you would be thinking about would be in the fall, this fall, starting to look at programs so that you would uh, uh, be able to prepare, take the exams and get your application materials in by the end of the calendar year uh, for uh, beginning graduate study in the following fall. So um, some of you, I know that just talking with you, some of you have asked me about that, maybe other use of you had that in mind, but you certainly keep that in mind. Uh, as, uh, as a possibility. Uh, again, it's uh, in the U.S. in physical sciences and physics, you know, a very large uh, fraction of the students in graduate level are from, from abroad. I'm not sure if this has been said yet, but uh, one of the general ways to find uh, collaborators, not just international ones, is to uh, Go to conferences. So uh, I went to a conference in uh, Cambridge, England, and uh, listened to a couple of talks. And one person's talk really uh, appealed to me, and uh, I went up after and talked to them about it. And this is a good idea, just in general. Whenever you're at a talk, listen to the talk, think about something interesting about what they've said. Afterwards, go up and tell them how interesting their talk was. People love to hear how interesting their talks are. Um, that starts up a conversation, and we ended up uh, doing a project together. I spent about uh, two months in that person's lab. We uh, did a project using MRI and uh, uh, got uh, two publications out of it. So uh, I think that's a sort of general way to uh, to meet people and um, to you get a, at a, at an international conference. You get a lot of. Uh, you get a lot of different people, and uh, so there's a good chance of finding someone, uh, you know, who uh, might, you might be interested in collaborating with. So it is good to go, go to conferences and meet people and talk to them, and that one of the best ways to make contacts. But once you have a contact, you don't have to travel to the other country with Skype. I've had recent uh, collaboration with a person I met at a conference a couple years ago and haven't didn't meet for two years after that, but we wrote a paper together. And for a period of time, we had a Skype with uh, a student of mine and a student of uh, the professor. 
who uh, work, and if you have a regular Skype meeting, say once a week, then everyone's responsible for getting something new for the next week. It's like having a group meeting where you're actually in the same place, but it doesn't cost anything to be anywhere in the world. And you can have an hour Skype and plan what, what is our goal for the next week. And, and that can be very productive. Okay, so at this point, uh, we're still waiting for uh, Joe Nimala, who has not yet appeared. Uh, we hope he will appear, but uh, why don't we open up the floor to questions? While you're waiting for questions, let me also point to some opportunities at my university itself, which for which you, the funding doesn't come from any of the funding agencies, right? So you directly apply to the university. Go to oist.jp. So our university is by law required to have 50% of students and researchers from outside Japan. So we have no choice. We have to do it. And if you click on the graduate school page, you have internships, admissions. All of them are funded by the university, including your flights, your stay. When you apply, uh, because I have received a lot of inquiries from amongst you, when you apply, make sure that your recommendation letters come in on time. Pay attention to your letter, your statement, and your CV. Having uh, a perfect Mis uh, spelling mistake free uh, packet may not get you an admission or an internship, but having spelling mistakes or grammatical errors m may hurt your chances. And why make life difficult for yourself when there is already so much of competition, right? So pay attention to those details. It, it's perfectly okay to directly write any of the faculty and discuss with them a project in advance, okay? Don't, don't feel uh, uh, don't feel any inhibition. Just write them. We are all normal people like you. And uh, we respond to emails. Maybe a little slow compared to you all, but uh, because we get roughly 200 to 300 emails a day, but we still do. So I just want to leave you with that. Uh, but questions? Questions, people? Questions? <coughs> yeah, so some of the... F yeah, <laughs> sure. So uh, in ICTP, there is this associateship for faculty members to come in. Um, so I wanted to ask this to Professor Nemila when he was here, but... Uh, any of you know more about how to apply for associateship? No, okay. Okay. Okay, then in Okinawa, is there a... Some we have an associate back here, so uh, actually this is... Uh, okay, he can... Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And I... Actually, in ICTP, they have uh, a large opportunities. Uh, the first one, they have three categories of uh, associates. The first one is junior associates. Those are uh, master degree students, uh, PhD uh, with P PhD, uh, regular associates till the age of 45, and then senior associates. Okay. Uh, the three categories are open all for all applicants from developing countries. Few opportunities from people from developed countries also. Uh, the funds almost the same for three categories. You can bring your family for two months per year. The duration of associates is uh, six years. Uh, you have three travels during the six years. So you have opportunity to come year by year or one go, th three, three consecutive years. You have the opportunity for that. 
uh, they have uh, a kind of quota. I mean, from each country, they have certain opportunities. So sometimes you might have very good application, but limited by numbers for from Egypt or for uh, Indonesia or from any country. They have limited numbers to be distributed around the world. This is uh, the first part of associates. Uh, other parts, they have very good program, a step program for PhD students. You have to register for your PhD at your home countries. And you have, uh, by this program, you have an opportunity to come here for, for one year, each uh, six months in Italian Institute. So you have supervisor here in Italy and supervisor from your home country. And you can do all your experimental research here in Italy. Uh, three visits, two visits or three visits. Uh, each visit, uh, maximum six months. Uh, the third thing I would like to add also, they have uh, another program. It's not ICTP, it is TWAS, TWAS, Third World Academy of Science. You can open it, please. Uh, yeah, yes. It is just here in uh, operation office, in front of uh, operation office, the first floor. Yes, uh, yeah. Actually, they have a lot, a lot of opportunities but in developing countries, from in Turkey, in uh, China, in uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, they have uh, postdoc opportunities, they have uh, PhD opportunities, master programs, uh, short visit for two months for scientists from developing countries. Even if you have an, an, a conference in your home country, you have an opportunity to invite scientists from developed countries with full fund. So they have very uh, a lot of opportunities. I think you can just uh, take a look at uh, this website. And even you can register, and they sent you the deadlines always. There is a new application. Uh, the last thing about this, they have awards, uh, very good awards. I won one of the young scientists before five years, in 2011, yes. Um, very, very good award, amount of money and reputation also for all uh, scientists, senior and junior scientists. So you can apply also. I think this is a very good opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suleiman. Thanks. Um, so with Professor Bandi, with the o Okinawa Institute, uh, so similarly for faculty members, is there a short-term visit or short-term associateship? Sabbaticals. Sabbaticals. So uh, if for, for faculty who want to come and spend time at, uh, at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, you write the faculty directly and set it up with them because they have to negotiate a, a budget to host you for a certain period of time. Uh, this, is, this could be visiting researcher or a sabbatical. Uh, I would like first to thank all the faculty members for all their efforts because we learned a lot from them. Uh, it was so it was not not only the content of the courses but also by observing you and how you organize this uh, this uh, hands-on research school. And um, I would like to ask you about what are the qualities you are looking for when you receive uh, applications. Um, I know that. Well, it, it said that the work is the best ambassador of a student, so uh, the list of its publications, uh, of his publications, etc. Et but also, are, are there other, like, let's say, green flags that uh, encourages a professor uh, or a PI to recruit or to uh, accept a student for, like, postdoc or PhD program? Thank you. So I'll say a little bit about that. So I'm going to think about it in terms of, let's say, you're applying to a graduate program and PhD program in the United States. So uh, certainly uh, your track record plays a very big role. And if you're, you've participated and done research, say, at a master's level, 
Uh, it's important to have good letters of recommendation, not perfunctory letters, meaning not they have. If the letters are very specific, saying you you know you did this fantastic work on sand dunes and you know really talked about that work in great detail and says says that you're the best you know graduate student or master student the person has had in you know many years, those things matter a lot. More so than, say, a letter which says, you know, this is person, he was the best student I've ever known, and then says nothing else, anything specific about that. So those are really important um, letters, um, you know, um, that, that's, I would say that's a, that's a key thing to have in mind. Um, making, if you have a contact, like we have contacts now, and you know that you're interested in, uh, let's say coming to the United States to let's say Georgia Tech in physics, then use those contacts, right? And say maybe you're not interested in the particular research that let's say I do, but you say you see a program that's at the uh, in my department that you would be interested in. Use that sort of contact to find out, or you know those are those are important because then that person, if you've made contacts, you made a good uh, you know made a good contact and that's that's very helpful. So there's a couple of things to have in mind. Uh, let me let me add one thing to that in terms of uh, Professor Schatz talked about that how uh, recommendation letters should be specific and not generic. Uh, but when when you, when you approach somebody by email. I get lots of emails that say, Dear Professor Hunt, and several paragraphs, and somewhere it says, and I read your paper, quote, this, close quote, and then it goes on and on. And aside from those two little pieces of information, the same letter could have written, been written to any scientist. There is really nothing in this message that says that the person didn't just do a web search and cut and paste a couple things into a form letter and send this letter out to 500 different scientists. So, to be honest, I don't even respond to such messages. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 it can be more effective to choose 10 potential mentors and spend some hours on each one really trying to learn as much as you can about them and write a detailed message that's specific to them, makes it clear to them that, 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 that you are interested specifically in them and not that you are just emailing as many people as you can. And if you do 10, you know, contacts like that, that will be much more effective than, uh, than, than 500 form others. Another thing also is, is uh, most of us are not nearly as good as Professor Schatz at remembering names and faces. I am always amazed <laughs> at his ability to do so. And for instance, it, so if, it, it, you know, as Mark said, meeting people at conferences, making contacts is, is a great way to get started. And if you write to one of us, say in two months from now, please remind us. I, I, I met you at the hands-on school, and, and I, I apologize that I may not remember. <laughs> so, you know, re, you know re, remind us of the context in which we've met, and that, that can also be, you know, a more effective way to get a positive response if, if you are in a situation of just emailing somebody. Let me add a couple of uh, points to, the, uh, to what Mike and Brian said. When you send an email to uh, a potential collaborator or to a faculty with whom you are interested in working, uh, make judicious use of the space because people, all of us are busy. You are busy and so are we. So make very good use of the subject line because that more or less decides whether I'm immediately going to look at the mail or not. So for instance, if you write me, as Brian said, we may not remember your names, but you're not headless personalities to us. We remember your faces, right? But in an email, that, uh, that might not connect immediately. So just say, for, in, for example, hands-on 2016 alumnus request help. We'll immediately look at it, right? And in the email, keep it brief. But uh, concise, but to the point. Come straight to the point. It helps. The second, on recommendation letters. In my culture, where in India, recommendation letters are looked down upon, not in sciences, but when you go for other jobs. 
So when I was applying for graduate school, I was actually very confused. And recommendation is a kind of a looked as a, as a form of bribery. But over the years, I came to see, no, this is actually a vetting process. Because the, the students we want to take, the postdocs we want to hire, uh, we, want to know, we want to know how good a match we are going to be with them. What's happening? OK. So the letters play a very important role in the decision-making process. But it works through a system of goodwill. If, say, uh, if suppose you, one of your professors writes a letter that you are their best student but does not give enough details, then we don't know enough. Or uh, abuses the opportunity, then the goodwill is lost forever. We do not abuse that. Okay? Other questions? Okay, so uh, we are sort of at the limit of our time, um, so we'll just bring this, uh, this session to a close, uh, make a few announcements though. So posters, uh, the posters that, your posters are now available for you to pick up uh, with one um, sort of caution. Uh, so the posters are in Lundquist, which is two doors down. They're laid out. They're in three separate piles in order. Uh, for session one, session two, session three. Uh, in that same room, there are uh, poster tubes, the cardboard tubes, which you can use to roll up your poster, put them inside, and take them back with you. The sort of caution is, is that we don't yet have quite enough tubes in there. We have about half the number. The rest should be delivered by, say, noon today. So I would say, if you, unless you really have to have your poster now, you're leaving now, okay? Hold off and wait till after that morning hands-on session. Then come down to Lundquist. There should be enough tubes. You can get your poster out. Take it out. Try to keep things in orderly in piles so someone else who comes later can find their poster more easily. Roll it up. Grab a, a cardboard tube and put that in so you have a nice uh, way to transport your poster back home. Um, the other uh, announcements I'll say is uh, we have our morning hands-on sessions, the last one after that, basically free time, uh, and then we'll, we'll meet and convene at 8 o'clock uh, upstairs at the terrace for awards. So we'll have the poster awards, uh, we'll have certificates for everyone, we'll have a banquet uh, as well. Yes? Well, yeah, I, I just want to make sure people are clear that, that, that the 8 o'clock award ceremony will include dinner, yeah. right? It will include a full dinner? Dinner, yes. yes. So you don't have to eat dinner before that. Yes. <laughs> Any other announcements, questions? Okay, so let's uh, proceed to our last hands-on session. <laughs> <laughs>